We live in a very exciting world today, a world where technology is advancing at a staggering pace, a world where data is just exploding, tons of data being generated. It was only yesterday, or maybe a few years ago, when we thought of data in kilobytes, one paragraph of text. And then we moved up to a megabyte, a short novel. Then we went on to digitize Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, and the sound wave was about a gigabyte. Today, we're talking about billions of photos being uploaded on Facebook, and that's a petabyte. So where does this all end? Well, by 2015, another year and a half, or maybe just a year, we're going to reach the zettabyte era. That means we've reached the end of the English alphabet. So data is supposed to stop growing. Not really. Well, we go on to yottabytes after that. How many of you have a cup of coffee in front of you or a bottle of water? Raise it. Well, think of that bottle of water as 11-ounce cup as a gigabyte. If we were to stack these side to side and up and down, it would cover the entire Great Wall of China, and that would be one zettabyte. And then we could zip up to the moon, and we'd see it. And then we could start to play around with it, because when you're far away, you can see better when it's so large, right? Well, so who is gen generating all this data? Well, if, you, if you're like me, and your answer to one of these questions is yes. Anybody who tweeted while you were here, or Snapchatted, or posted on Facebook, or maybe used Foursquare to check in here, well, you're part of this crowd that's generating data. And you're doing it very rapidly. More than 100,000 tweets per minute. That's 60 seconds. That's the time it takes me to complete two sentences, or so my students tell me. Um, several hundred websites going up for minute. So obviously, this is all happening very, very fast. But it's a paradigm shift that's happening in our world of big data. And in order to understand this paradigm shift, we have to understand three fundamental characteristics about big data. The first one is called datafication. I'm sure it's going to get added to the Webster's Dictionary very soon. This is the phenomenon of sensors being embedded in almost everything around us. And what's happening is the line between the physical world and the digital world is actually blurring. So we're actually becoming digitized. Here is the health internet of things with lots of interesting sensors that are going to get embedded in the human body. My personal favorite is this tongue scraper and this toothbrush, which will notify us of bad breath. But there's lots of other sensors as well that are going to constantly generate data. The other aspect, the second aspect of this paradigm shift, is each of these pieces of data comes with two very important added semantics. And that is, it has a timestamp, and it has a spatial location associated with it. So that's really interesting, because then we can make sense of the data in a much better way. And finally, there's billions of interactions happening because of all of us constantly generating this data. And we're leaving massive footprints. And this then makes big data a laboratory for understanding the pulse of humanity. Very exciting. So how do we use all this big data? How do we consume it so that we can create a smarter world? Well, we can visualize it. We can understand the interactions among these pieces of data to interpret it and act on it. So how do we do this? Let me take you through three examples that our research center is working on. The first one is on making sense out of big data through social streams such as Twitter. Well, you look at Twitter and you say, what's the big deal, 140 characters? But when you look through that 140 characters, there's really a lot of interesting stuff in that. There is hashtags, there are URLs, there are user IDs, there's timestamps and locations. So we're working with a large hospital 
where we're dealing with asthma. There are more than 25 million people in the U.S. suffering from asthma. And a lot of them often end up in the emergency room. And the emergency room is really not very well prepared to deal with this onslaught of asthma sufferers. So can we use big data to build models in real time that will predict when people are going to rush to the emergency room? And turns out, well, Twitter is actually a very interesting source of data. It, people, when they're having an asthma attack, often tweet before they reach for their inhaler. And this is very interesting because that gives us real-time insight into who's actually going to go into the emergency room. There's lots of noise, of course, but you can take that out and extract the signal. And you can see people tweeting about wheezing, about asthma attacks, and so on. You can also take the timestamp and kind of look at whether the rate at which these tweets are coming out are increasing or decreasing. You can plot them on a map because we have locations. And so even without a map, you can start to see the outline of a map and see where these tweets are coming from. Further, you can start to zoom in on it. And so here, there's lots of tweets from the US. And then you can start to understand the keywords they're using. And then finally, you can feed it into a predictive model, which will help us figure out when someone's going to end up before they end up in the emergency room, which means the emergency room can be better prepared. So big data from social streams like Twitter is very useful. But my favorite way to analyze big data is to really not think of these pieces of data as individual data objects, but really to start creating connections among them. And when you create connections, you can use network science. The science of networks has been often used in biology to study protein pathways and gene functions and so on. So why not use it in the world of big data? Because these networks are of many different kinds. And the interesting thing about big data is some of these networks actually are hidden in the data, and you need to extract them, make them visible, and make them explicit. And then you can start to create all different kinds of networks between people, between objects like web pages, between cars, between places, and so on. So our next project is really taking some of these social streams and using network analysis on it, and this is what we came up with when we used millions of tweets from news agencies. Well, so you're going to look at it and say, this is all network sciences? It looks like a giant hairball. What am I going to do with it? Well, there's actually very interesting mathematical structures underlying these networks. And you can use those mathematics to extract subparts of these networks. And now you're starting to get computational art. But you're also starting to get some nice pictures out of this when you visualize it. This is an example of tweets from New York Times, and it shows you how these tweets propagated over time. Well, this is just for one news agency. You can also compare one news agency with another. So on one side, you see New York Times. On the other, you see BBC. And here you're seeing these tweets with very different propagation patterns. You can even calculate the velocity at which these tweets are spreading. You can calculate the lifespan of the tweets. You can see which articles are spreading fast, which are slow. This is growth over time. So this is still a static picture. What about doing a dynamic analysis? Well, we can do that. So this video shows you as these tweets are coming out, they're starting to spread. You can clearly see a pattern developing here. This is the center node is New York Times, and all these are people who are retweeting New York Times. On this side, we see individuals. And this is interesting because there are other kinds of influencers. So now, as a news agency, I start to see, wow, this is the pattern of propagation. Maybe I can use these people to help spread my articles. I can even use it to develop dynamic, real-time pricing. I can zoom in on a specific article. So this was an article that came out of Mashable. And in the first hour, it had start, started showing viral tendencies. 
to spread. And then you can also see what happened in the second hour. And then it went on to spread virally over a 24-hour period. So all of these things can just be extracted using networks and analyzed and used for different purposes. And that can create a much smarter world. So closer to home, at the University of Arizona campus, we have 40,000 people using a smart card. They use it to enter the dorms, buildings, rec center. They use it on vending machines. They use it to, for haircuts. They use it for different services in the student union. And you can build networks out of these. These networks are showing you places that are linked with each other because the same people do transactions. And so you can slice and dice these networks in different ways. So this is an example of our undergrad students. And this is showing you the network between 6 and 10 AM in the morning confirming that our undergrad students like to get up late. This is showing you the lunchtime crowd. You can even look at it from a different angle. You can look at the behavior using these networks during uh, certain holiday periods versus weekends versus weekdays and so on. You can also compare out-of-state and in-state tuitions. And by the way, we love our out-of-state uh, students because their network looks very dense, much like this. And our in-state students look like this. So we want people spending more money in our student union. Well, but can we do a dynamic temporal analysis? So this is uh, a picture of our student union, the second floor. And we're going to go in and look at one particular day, October 1, uh, sort of middle of the semester last, uh, this past year. And we can take the smart card data and sort of use it like four square check-ins. And you start to see patterns. So this is early in the morning. They're starting to do patterns, but it's, the numbers show you the same person going to another location and doing a second transaction. So using this, you can start to analyze the people who kind of grab coffee, then go to Einstein's Bagel, then sometimes go pick up a sandwich. Then this is the lunchtime crowd that's starting. You're starting to see all these different pathways and transitions that are happening. So now this can help us devise better ways to manage crowds during the rush hour. This is another uh, picture of the same map, except this time we don't have the map behind it. You just start to see these patterns of transitions. Again, this is interesting because it tells us the behavior of people, what they're doing, where they're going, and it can help us plan our campus and design a much smarter campus. So essentially, what big data can do for us is it can help us create a smarter world if we manage to harvest it by understanding its fundamental properties. We can use data science. We can use network science. We can use visualizations. We can understand the underlying structure of the network, un understand the dynamics of the network, and then build predictive models. So, We've come a long way from being a civilization of hunters and gatherers. We have a long way to go. So come join me and become big data gatherers and analyzers on our way to creating a new civilization. Thank you.